Good morning, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone. I call this June 2020 open meeting of the NCRA Board to order. The NCRA Board unanimously voted late yesterday afternoon to remove proposed rule part 702, risk-based network, from today's meeting agenda. Agency business required the removal and no earlier announcement of the change was possible. As in our previous board meetings over the last several months, I will again note for the record that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, today's meeting is open to the public via a live webcast only. Thank you, as always, to the NCRA staff who have stepped up to make it possible for us to continue operations during this difficult time by keeping the NCUA open for business. I'd like to begin today with a few observations on the events of recent weeks. It was just one month ago today that George Floyd died in Minneapolis while in police custody. There's no question there's a tremendous amount of pain and anger surrounding these issues of another instance of abuse of authority against a black man. But at the same time, I'm heartened by the response I've heard from so many in the credit union community. If there's a common thread to what I'm hearing, it's that people want to know what they can do that will truly make a difference. People want to move beyond platitudes and vague expressions of support so that we can focus on real changes that will have a concrete impact. I appreciate that line of thinking as it corresponds to my own beliefs and to the goals I've been working toward throughout my professional career and my entire life. One of these goals is financial inclusion, which I believe must be a top priority for those of us who work in and around financial services. While much of the policy focus in recent weeks has been on abuse of authority, if we truly want to make a difference in minority communities, we need to think more broadly about how we can create opportunity by bringing more Americans into the mainstream financial system. As you've all heard me say before, financial inclusion is truly the civil rights issue of our time. Earlier this month, some of you may have seen an opinion column I wrote for the Wall Street Journal focused on what the financial industry could do better to promote financial inclusion. I was certainly glad to have the opportunity to present my ideas in a widely read venue like the Journal, but I admit I only had 500 words to make the case. Honestly, I could have written 5,000 words, and it still wouldn't have been enough to get all of my thoughts out there to address this pernicious issue. The piece is the continuation of much longer conversations that need to take place, and that conversation has been ongoing my life as a man of color, but the conversation can and should continue today. I'd like to focus on a few things we're doing here at NCUA and things we can do to encourage and incentivize financial inclusion. This is by no means an exhaustive list, and I'm sure my colleagues and those in the public will offer other helpful ideas as we consider concrete action on these issues. Today, we have an item on our board agenda that should be an important part of that conversation. The NCRA has just published our annual report on minority depository institutions, detailing the progress NDIs have made over the last year and our efforts to preserve and promote those important financial institutions. Given their importance to some of the most hard-pressed communities, we need to do everything we can to better support those vital institutions, so this report and this discussion today are all timely. Secondly, we encourage credit unions to take the annual voluntary credit union diversity self-assessment. Last year, we had 118 credit unions complete the survey. The year before that, we had 81. This is progress year over year, but it is not good enough. As the industry is looking for what it can do, this is a small step. The diversity assessment is a valuable tool for credit unions seeking to make stronger commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It helps industry leaders to see areas in which they can strengthen that commitment for the benefit of your employees, your member owners, and your local communities. So, credit unions, if you haven't completed the assessment online at the NCRA website, you can find it at cudiversity.ncua.gov. I repeat, cudiversity.ncua.gov. So please commit to taking the survey at your earliest convenience. Third, many credit unions have been working diligently to incorporate more financial technology or fintech tools into their operations. We all know that these tools are going to be an increasingly important part of improving customer outreach and customer service and efficiency 
especially as the pandemic has driven more and more banking into a digital world. But let's not overlook that these FinTech tools can also be very powerful in helping connect minority communities, rural communities, and other underserved populations with mainstream financial products. Over the last year, I've been working with credit unions to better understand the regulatory framework they need to more effectively incorporate FinTech to not only promote innovation, but also to enhance access, access to minority communities and underserved areas. I hope we can accelerate that work. If leveraged appropriately, FinTech can be of a tremendous strategic importance in expanding access to quality, affordable financial services to those underserved communities. And finally, we must face up to the reality that we still have much work to do internally here at NCUA. This agency has long been a leader on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we've strengthened that commitment earlier this year with the establishment of the Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Council. But, for example, we also know that African Americans are underrepresented in the context of principal examiner promotion processes, which is something I've been working on becoming, which I've been working on to address this issue since becoming chairman, and will continue to do so. We must always remember that if we're going to talk to talk about the importance of equity, we must also be prepared to walk the walk, modeling equity in our own ranks, just as we expect it of others in the industry that we regulate. Again, as I often say, financial inclusion is the civil rights issue of our time. I repeat that so frequently because I truly believe it, and I truly believe it because I've seen how powerful it can be when we bring people into the mainstream economic system. Just last year, I visited one of our regular, one of our credit unions to a regular visit where I spoke with a young lady, a bus driver in Maryland, who had been outside the financial mainstream. She joined the credit union and was able to work with that credit union through educational counseling, financial capability tools, and she was able to boost her credit score from 500 to 740. This member now has built a credit score over the time of working with her local credit union that has now resulted in her getting mainstream financial products such as credit card, checking and savings accounts, and she's now on her pathway to getting her first home. Her story is indeed a case study in how financial inclusion makes a real difference in people's lives. It's a success I'd like to see repeated again and again and again for Americans and communities throughout this country, and especially in those hard-hit communities of color and rural areas. I believe we can all work together to achieve that goal. I believe credit you is an ideal tool for achieving that goal, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you over the course of my chairmanship and remaining years on the NCRA board to continue working toward that goal. I also, ladies and gentlemen, recently asked NCRA executive team, our team, to develop a plan that would enable us to begin transitioning to normal operations while also incorporating necessary accommodations that would ensure the safety, health, and well-being of our employees and contractors. NCRA's executive team, in turn, created a phased approach for resumption of on-site operations. I know that many of you received the letter that we signed recently regarding our resumption of operations, where we gave a date of July 6. I would like to you all to know this morning directly from the chairman that we will not be resuming operations on July 6. We will give you ample time and notice so that we can give you all the tools that you will need when we do resume operations. And again, we will give ample time, but it will not be taking place on July 6 as originally communicated. In creating our plan, the NCRA team solicited employee feedback from the NCRA Workforce Readiness Group, where they had a survey. They consulted expert guidance, and they received it from the CDC, FEMA, and other government agencies. And also, the agency partnered with a public health firm that's been on retainer to provide advice on COVID-19-related matters. With that guidance, Again, the three-phase transition plan was created that outlines how and when staff can return to injury offices and begin an on-site presence at credit unions. Over the course of the plan, necessary adjustments to work schedules and precautionary hygiene and sanitation protocols will also be made. So the plan is in indeed very, very comprehensive. Our top priority is that of ensuring the health, safety, and well-being of NCA personnel at all times 
while executing our mission, as well as credit union staff and their members being safe and healthy as well. Presently, our intention is to begin the phased transition process, not as July 6th as scheduled, but we will again be looking to give ample time as to when we can uh, bring our employees back. And our approach, you all, is similar to what the other financial regulators are doing, including the FDIC. This is indeed a highly fluid situation, and it can be specific to certain geographic regions. It's because of that reason, you all, because of the geographic things that we're seeing taking place in Arizona and Texas and other areas of the world, we again remain confident that July 6th is not the ideal time. I would note, you all, that it's also critically important for us to realize that the NCRA approach to resuming operations would not be a one-size-fits-all approach. It would be tailored to market conditions, to market locality transition activities that are taking place. So please know we will work with all of you to ensure your safe being remain of paramount importance. So thank you. Now switching to today's agenda. The first item on our agenda is a board briefing on the Minority Depository Institutions Annual Report. Staff presenting Pamela Williams, Program Manager, Minority Depository Institutions, from the team of Credit Union Resource Expansion, known as CURE. Good morning, Pamela. Good morning, Chairman Hood, and thank you. Good morning, Board Member McWaters, and good morning, Board Member Harper. Thank you all for the opportunity today to present the NCUA's 2019 Annual Report to Congress on the agency's efforts to preserve existing and promote the formation of new minority depository institutions. This report was developed in accordance with Section 308 of the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act of 1989 and Section 367 of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2019, uh, I'm sorry, of 2010. The report is available on the agency's website. Slide three. A federally insured credit union can qualify as an MDI if 50% or more of its board members, current members, and eligible potential members combined with current members are minorities. A minority is defined as any Black American, Asian American, Hispanic American, or Native American, according to Section 308 of FERIA. MDI credit unions are often the only federally insured financial institution available in communities that have been historically unserved by traditional financial institutions. They play a critical role in making sure safe and affordable financial products and services, including credit, are available to minority individuals and businesses. Slide four. At the end of 2019, the NCUA regulated 514 federally insured credit unions with the MDI designation. These MDIs were located throughout 36 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. MDI credit unions served more than 3.9 million members and had assets of $40.5 billion at the end of 2019. In comparison, at the end of 2018, the NCUA supervised 529 MDI credit unions with total assets of $38.47 billion and approximately 3.9 million members. Slide four. Approximately 10% of all federally insured credit unions are MDIs. These institutions are generally small. 57% of them have less than $10 million in total $10 million in total assets. Next slide, please. This map shows the geographic and aggregate numerical distribution of MDI credit unions throughout the country. Texas, California, New York, Hawaii, Louisiana, and Illinois had the highest number of MDIs in 2019. Next slide. This map 
map shows the aggregate distribution of MDI members by state. With more than 1.5 million members, Texas has the largest membership, followed by Hawaii, California, Maryland, and New Mexico. Next slide. This map shows the geographic distribution of aggregate MDI assets by state. With more than $15 billion, Texas MDIs have the largest asset total, followed by Hawaii, California, Maryland, New Mexico, the District of Columbia, and North Carolina. Each of those states and the district has more than $1 billion in aggregate assets. Next slide. Under FERIA, the NCUA has a statutory goal to preserve and promote MDIs and provide them other forms of support. The agency takes this responsibility seriously. Through the NCUA, MDI credit unions have access to grants and loans as eligible, training and technical assistance. Many also receive guidance and support from their examiners. Next slide. A key part of the agency's efforts is preserving the minority character of MDIs that merge. Of the 20 MDIs merged during 2019, six of the continuing credit unions were MDIs. In total, MDI mergers represented approximately 14% of all merger approvals in 2019. The consolidation of MDI credit unions is consistent with long-term trends observed in the credit union and banking systems. During the year, the NCUA chartered one new federal credit union, the Otto Missouri Federal Credit Union in Red Rock, Oklahoma. This credit union serves the approximately 4,200 members and employees of the Otto Missouri tribe, as well as 17 tribally owned businesses. Next slide. The technical, the NCUA awarded $738,000 in technical assistance grants to 58 MDI credit unions in 2019. These credit unions use the funding to develop digital tools for members, outreach programs, fund staff training, advance initiatives to support underserved communities, and assist credit union staff to become certified financial counselors. In 2019, the NCUA created the MDI Mentoring Pilot Initiative. It is not reflected on this slide, but it awards grants to encourage relationships between larger low-income credit unions and small MDIs. MDIs receive technical assistance from the mentor credit unions under this initiative. Three MDIs were awarded $75,000 in aggregate under this initiative. Next slide. In 2020, the NCUA continues to build on its efforts and initiatives to support MDIs. So far, the NCUA has co-sponsored the Freedmen's Bank Forum with the U.S. Department of Treasury and other federal financial institution regulators on March 3, hosted a two-day MDI forum on March 3 and 4, and made $125,000 available to support MDI credit unions through our MDI mentoring grant. Next slide. For more information on the NCUA's MDI Preservation Program, visit our website or contact the Office of Credit Union Resources and Expansion at curemail, that's C-U-R-E mail, at ncua.gov. This concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer your questions. Great. Thank you for your presentation this morning, Pamela. I really appreciate it. And I'm especially delighted that you referenced the Older Missouri 
Federal Credit Union. That was a credit union charter that I was able to present to them uh, within months of their opening. And I was so pleased to travel there uh, to the tribal land and to meet with the leaders and to see uh, the great work that that credit union is going to be able to do to address a lot of the things around financial inclusion. In the spirit of fostering greater financial inclusion for all Americans, uh, the NCUA last week issued its 2019 annual report to Congress on preserving minority depository institutions, which details the financial condition of minority credit unions in 2019, which uh, Pamela just mentioned, and the agency's efforts to preserve and promote the formation of minority depository institutions. I've had a number of meetings with members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and many of those members are recognizing the important role that credit unions play. And we, I'm pleased to report, are getting several questions about folks wanting to know how there can be new or de novo credit unions created in some of the areas that need the most. The release of last week's report on Friday was purposeful, as it fell on the 155th celebration of Juneteenth the most widely recognized observance of the end of slavery in the United States. Although the Emancipation Proclamation had declared them to be free on January 1, 1863, enslaved men and women in Texas only learned about their freedom on June 19, 1865, when Union soldiers arrived at Galveston, Texas, and announced the absolute equality of rights between slave owners and slaves. The recent protests across America and the COVID-19 pandemic, which has disproportionately affected minority communities, have illustrated the economic and financial challenges of minority, rural, and underserved communities. These events underscore the importance of minority depository institutions, especially those NDI credit unions, that play a role in really promoting inclusion and also promoting the well-being of minority communities in underserved areas. The agency's efforts to preserve and promote the formation of new NDIs play a critical role in advancing financial inclusion and the economic well-being of underserved areas. NDI credit unions represent approximately 10% of all federally insured credit unions. The NCRA has and will continue to find more avenues of support for these institutions, so much needed capital can flow into overlooked or underserved areas. At its heart, Financial inclusion means expanding access to safe, affordable, and accessible financial services for unbanked and underserved people and communities, as well as broadening employment and business opportunities. Each of us has a stake in this outcome. Pamela, I do have a few questions. The report provides examples of how examiners work with NDIs. How does CURE keep examiners and other field staff apprised of the services available to NDIs? Thank you, Chairman. Beginning in 2018, CURE introduced semi-annual conference calls with examining staff. We realize that the examining staff are key to our outreach and getting information to credit unions that need it the most. The attendees of these conference calls include two representatives from each regional office and the supervisory examiners from each region who have the highest concentration of MDIs in their portfolios. The conference calls provide an opportunity for these credit unions, for these staff to receive updates on services and initiatives available to MDIs through CURE and thereby enable them to direct the MDIs to such resources. Our first conference call of 2020 was earlier this month. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. One of the FIREA goals related to MDIs is promoting and encouraging creation of new minority depository institutions. What can you share about the work your office is doing in this area? Especially, as I've mentioned, some members of the Congressional Black Caucus delegation are really looking to us to really help create opportunities for new MDIs. Okay. From the, their initial contact with our office, we begin educating organizing groups about minority depository institutions. An organizing group goes through an online application and it includes information on MDIs in order to help the group determine whether the credit union might be an MDI. This also helps our staff identify potential MDIs. 
By way of a, a, a status update, a number of organizer groups have contacted our office seeking to charter a credit union. They are in various stages of the chartering process, so it is premature to reveal any specifics on any particular case at this time, but a couple do appear promising as potential MDIs. Thank you, Chairman. Well, that's great to hear, and I look forward to the opportunity once they are approved to present them with their charters, as I did with the Oda Missouri group there in Oklahoma. Pamela, I also understand that there are a number of credit unions that are eligible for MDI self-designation, but often opt out. Could you please talk more about credit unions expressing concern over the lack of incentive for becoming an MDI? Yes, we hear this as well, Chairman Hood. Unlike the statute for the low-income designation that NCUA confers, the MDI statute does not convey a financial benefit to credit unions that have the designation. This for us is often cited as the region, reason eligible credit unions opt out of the designation, and it creates a challenge to promote the designation to eligible credit unions. However, CURE has and continues to develop resources targeted towards MDIs. The MDI mentor, Mentoring Grant Pilot in 2019 and the Companion MDI Mentoring Cohort being piloted this year are examples of such resources. Additionally, during 2019, the NCUA's Online Learning Management Service identified a section of training materials that are specifically targeted towards the needs of MDIs. Great, thank you. And I just have two more questions. I was delighted that you mentioned the MDI Mentoring Grant Program in your remarks. What is the agency doing to make sure the credit unions are aware of the funding opportunities? I know you mentioned some of the success and the, the level of support from last year. But what is the agency doing now to make sure the credit unions are aware of the funding opportunities and that proper staff is available to provide technical assistance when needed? Right. To, to address the first part about the outreach to ensure that credit unions are aware of this opportunity, peer staff coordinate with the NCUA's Office of External Affairs and Communications to use multiple communication channels to inform MBIs of these opportunities. These channels include the NCUA website, direct email, and social media. I'd like to use this platform to remind MDIs that earlier this week, the NCUA announced the deadline for the 2020 MDI mentoring grant is extended until July 31. Application guidelines are available on the NCUA website. And to address your second point, Chairman, about resources available to assist credit unions in answering their questions, staff will be available from our office to answer questions through July 29 for the 2020 MDI Mentoring Grant Round. Credit unions should submit their questions by email to CureApps, that's C-U-R-E-A-P-P-S, at ncua.gov. Thank you to, for the opportunity to make this platform available, Chairman Hood. You're indeed welcome. And again, I just want to reiterate it for everyone joining us today. The mentoring grants are going to be extended for the deadline of July 31st. So please, July 31st, and we have $125,000 available for this round of MDI mentoring grants. So please take advantage of those. My final question, Pamela, Okay, so you could look at slide five, and I love how you give me all the states where we have MDIs, but I notice that we have no MDI credit unions in Alaska. Are native Alaskans eligible as a minority to be an MDI? Yes, they absolutely are. Native Alaskans are included in the Native American category, and we are working to increase our outreach to Alaska for credit unions that might be eligible to be MDIs. Great, thank you so much. Before I recognize Board Member Harper, 
I want to thank him for the very thoughtful statements and insight he shared during the NCUA African American Employee Resource Group call last week, and the resource group is known as Emoja. During this call, we had the opportunity to not only share, but also, and more importantly, listen to this group of employees. After that call, I walked away feeling we have work to do, especially in regard to unconscious bias. And I want to thank Mr. Harper for just really elevating and raising that concern and for all the other work and statements and uh, press releases that he's released in the wake of the tragedy of the George Floyd death. So I thank him for the work that he's doing. And I now recognize board member Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, um, on the issues of financial inclusion, which you have so um, focused on like a laser, uh, I am also wholeheartedly with you on the need for us to address economic equality and justice. Um, this is a moment in time that we have to use as a turning point and uh, we need to be taking concrete actions. And you have my commitment to working with you uh, to take those concrete actions. It's, it's very important that we change the way that we address the systemic, institutional, and historic racism that we have seen um, amongst and towards black communities. Uh, and even more so, uh, we need to change the course of history uh, in a permanent way. And I, I will continue to work with you on those itch issues, absolutely. And Pam, thank you for your work on the NCUA's 2019 Minority Depository Institution Report to Congress. MDIs are a critical part of our country's system of cooperative credit. As you noted in your presentation, the one in 10 federally insured credit unions, which self-designate as MDIs, expand access to credit for people of color and support minority and women-owned businesses. They are also often the only financial institution in underserved areas. Last year, as part of my efforts to get into the field, I visited Financial Health Federal Credit Union. The credit union is a minority depository institution with 10,000 members who are primarily low income and live in a financial desert within Indianapolis. But for Financial Health Federal Credit Union, there would not be one branch of a financial institution in an entire zip code. The credit union shared information with me about their strategies to educate their members about financial wellness. While there, I also learned how a city bus driver had fortuitously become the credit union's leading champion. Each day, the bus driver had become frustrated while driving riders to and from high-cost payday lenders. She knew that these individuals needed access to responsible and affordable credit. So one day she stopped at the credit union and asked them for their brochures. When she was handed a few flyers, she insisted that she needed many more. Today that bus driver is delivering more and more of her riders to the Financial Health Federal Credit Union instead of a payday lender. And these new members uh, of the credit union are obtaining access to affordable small dollar loans, gaining financial literacy and budgeting skills, and building credit histories so that they can get better uh, rates as their credit histories grow and improve. By law, the NCUA must allocate resources and efforts towards preserving minority depository institutions like Financial Health Federal Credit Union and encouraging new ones like Otto Missouri Federal Credit Union, which the NCUA chartered last year. This statutory requirement reinforces the importance and value of diversity, so we continue to create a better, stronger, and more responsive credit union system that includes everyone. In doing so, we can ultimately create a more perfect union. Because of the vital work performed by MDIs for their members and the unique services they provide their communities, I am fully committed to supporting MDIs and providing them with needed resources like training, grants, loans, technical assistance and mentoring opportunities. According to this most recent report to Congress, nearly nine out of 10 MDI credit unions report total assets of $100 million or less, compared to seven out of 10 for all federally insured credit unions. And nearly eight out of 10 MDI credit unions have the low income credit union designation compared to about five in 10 federally insured credit unions. For these reasons, MDI credit unions play an essential role in meeting the financial needs of communities of color 
and historically and uh, underserved and unbanked groups around the country. To preserve and grow these important financial institutions, we need to increase the agency's support for the MDI mentoring program, uh, uh, which encourages relationships between low-income designated credit unions as mentors and small MDIs as mentees. The agency, as noted earlier, is currently accepting grant applications through July 31st for the MDI uh, pilot program on mentoring. I encourage MDIs to apl apply for these uh, grants. We also need to reinstate the consulting services provided by the NCOA's Office of Credit Union Resources and Expansion, a request that I have heard over and over again when I speak with credit union leaders around the country. And the agency should continue to ask Congress to provide more funding for the Community Development Revolving Loan Fund so that we can help MDIs to better weather the COVID-19 pandemic. Because demand for these grants exceeds supply, I have advocated for an additional $10 million in funding. The NCOA should also ramp up its outreach to encourage more credit unions that qualify to designate their credit unions as MDIs. One of the ways we can do that is to create a more robust MDI program page on the NCUA website. Additionally, we should make the MDI forum an annual event and organize regional collaboration roundtables that bring together MDIs and potential partners. Pam, what, are, uh, what other sort of outreach has the NCUA done or should do to spread the word about MDIs? Absolutely. First of all, thank you, Board Member Harper, for sharing the story about the credit union you visited in Indianapolis and also yeah. for your support. Within CURE, we believe more credit unions meet the requirements to be an MDI and that there may be a lack of awareness of the designation within the field. During 2018, we conducted a social media awareness campaign through the then Office of Public and Congressional Affairs now the Office of External Affairs and Communications. Earlier this year, we initiated a letter campaign to non-MDI credit unions in Hawaii and Alaska, informing them about the designation and the process to become an MDI. This process begins through the MDI questions on the online credit union profile. We plan to conduct another social media campaign later this year to help continue to increase the awareness about the MDI designation and how it may be beneficial to the credit unions and the communities that they serve. Thank you, Pam. And Pam, you have my commitment uh, to supporting you in those outreach efforts. Whatever you need, please let me know uh, because I would like to uh, continue to advance this initiative within the MCUA. Knowing more about MDIs will help us to better allocate our support services and tailor programs in CURE to better serve credit unions. For example, more research on MDIs could help us to understand why operating expenses are 61 basis points higher on average at MDIs compared to all federally insured credit unions. Pam, what other research topics could the agency explore to better understand MDIs and how can we support them? We agree further study of MDIs would definitely be helpful. A couple areas um, that we would um, consider to explore are analysis of the financial performance and impact of MDIs, low income designated credit unions, as well as CDFI credit unions. The, um, particularly looking at the um, earnings and profitability, as you noted, would also help us, of all three models of, of credit unions, would help us determine whether or not any group has greater success in areas such as earnings, growth, or membership. Another area would be a comparative analysis of products and services offered by MDIs versus non-MDIs. This might help us better identify potential MDIs that have not self-designated and also to refine our ability to develop training, technical assistance, and program support to address the needs of those MDIs. Finally, um, an analysis of MDI mergers would be helpful to help determine key reasons for merging 
how many M, um, of the MDIs have merged into other MDIs, and also help us understand whether post-mergers, how have the surviving credit unions continued to serve the minority populations of the original credit unions? We think these could better inform our work, board member Hood. I'm sorry, board member Harper. Uh, completely fine, Pam. Uh, uh, Pam, those are really important issues uh, to study and explore. And I, I do want you to be reaching out to the our Office of uh, the Chief Economist uh, and others within the agency so that we can undertake that. And if we need additional budget resources for that in the next year, uh, please bring that to my attention because I, I would like to support that and move forward on these uh, research issues because they will help us to refine and improve the program. And finally, Pam, I do have um, uh, one other observation uh, or question that I want to make. Am I correct in observing that while the MDI designation will increase a credit union's access to resources from the MCUA, it will not result in more examiner time at that credit union? Yes, you're absolutely correct. Being designated as an MDI expands the access a credit union has to resources, such as those I've mentioned earlier in this report. It does not mean there is an increase in exam presence from the NCUA. This is the same for the low income designation, which for, for most MDIs, about 80% qualify. If this is a perception that keeps eligible credit unions from opting out of the designation, I hope we've cleared it up. Thank you for this opportunity, Board Member Harper. Absolutely, and, and thank you for that answer, Pam. It's, it's important that we reiterate that point over and over again. Um, although we have focused on MDIs this morning, I want to highlight, uh, again, an important tool regarding the broader issue of diversity and inclusion. Uh, and that issue is the NCUA's Voluntary Diversity Self-Assessment, available at CU Diversity. Dot ncua .gov. Let me say that again, cudiversity.ncua.gov. We need to continue to encourage more credit unions to complete the survey, and I stand absolutely with my fellow board members as well as the staff of the agency in working to push that issue and encourage more credit unions to, to take a look at the survey. The business case for diversity and inclusion is very clear. An investment in diversity and inclusion can result in better performance and growth. And the NCUA's voluntary diversity self-assessment is a great place to start that journey. In closing, the NCUA must support MDIs and grow our MDI program, especially if we are going to close the wealth gap and advance economic equality and justice. Pam, thank you again for your efforts in producing this year's MDI report and for your ongoing efforts to expand access to responsible credit and thrift and working to ensure that no one gets left behind. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions or comments. Great, thank you, Board Member Harper. And again, thank you for your ongoing support of financial inclusion. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to start by saying that I wholeheartedly agree with your comments and those of Board Member Harper. Uh, specifically, you. We at the NCUA, we can't stop the next George Floyd type atrocity, but working together, we can help to build a culture, a culture with zero tolerance for any discrimination based on race, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, and gender that most regrettably continues within our society today. As a federal agency, our Office of Minority and Women Inclusion, together with others, work to create and nurture a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the agency and the credit union community. Along these lines, I wish to note the creation of the Credit Union Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Collective. I encourage you to review the collective's website at www. C-U-D-E-I collective.org and consider taking the pledge. Uh, regarding the opening of the agency, last week I was briefed by 
our outside expert on possible coronavirus wave scenarios within the next few months. Based upon analysis from their independent epidemiological experts, our expert expects, and virtually every scientist I've, I've seen agrees, the most likely scenario is for another wave of coronavirus to begin within the immediate future if it hasn't already done so and continue to spike through the fall until reversing towards the end of the year. That's the science as we know it today, and I am not aware of any analysis from the scientific community that indicates this scenario is materially off the mark. We should follow the science and not reopen the agency until not sooner than the passing of the second coronavirus wave. We will have to consider future waves as the science develops. It is imperative that we not put our staff at risk. I wish to thank the NCUA Chair Hood for following the science and delaying the reopening of the agency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On MDI, I wish to thank Martha and Pamela for your presentation this morning and for the briefing you gave me a couple of days ago. It's very helpful. The key takeaway from today's presentation is that, sadly, MDS are disappearing institution by institution, and that's the unfortunate reality we face today. This paradigm presents two questions for our consideration. Why are MDS disappearing? And two, what can we do about it? I do not know the definitive answers to these inquiries, but will offer my thoughts for your consideration. As always, I welcome and value your comments and suggestions. MDS are principally disappearing because they cannot operate at the necessary economies of scale to support the business plan and model that are demanded by consumers of financial services today. This includes specific loan and account programs and other services that younger members in particular expect from their financial institutions. Most notably, today's members expect to conduct a distinct majority of their financial services from their smartphones and laptops. This includes not only reviewing their account balances, but also depositing checks, transferring funds, monitoring activity in their checking, savings, IRA, and other accounts, applying for auto, mortgage, and other loans, paying their credit card, utility, and other invoices, as well as engaging in an emerging and expanding array of other financial activities. I visit the local branch of my primary financial institution once per year, as do my 20-something sons. In my view, any financial institution that doesn't offer these services places itself at risk as today's younger generation transitions to middle-aged consumers with their enhanced needs for seamless access to and hassle-free financial services. The problem, of course, is that maintaining these sophisticated financial services in a secure environment requires the deep pockets that most MDIs simply don't have. While many, if not most, MDIs certainly appreciate the acute need to adopt these platforms, they don't because they can't afford the personnel, advisors, and consultants that are necessary to stand up and maintain the computer systems and networks serving as the back office for the most consumer-friendly financial services computer applications. Operating through a CUSO or, or another third party, while often more cost-effective, nevertheless presents a financial challenge to many MDIs. One approach is to consider mergers between smaller and financially weaker MDIs and other larger and more financially robust credit unions. This approach may solve one problem, the financial challenges of the MDIs, but it may create another problem, the closing of MDI branches that leave minority communities as financial deserts where residents do not have access to federally insured financial institutions within a reasonable distance. Another approach is to consider mergers between two MDI credit unions where the surviving MDI credit union continues to serve the fields and membership of both credit unions without abandoning either minority community to payday lenders and other similar institutions. These mergers only work if one of the emerging MDIs 
is sufficiently financially viable so as to assist the merging partner. A third approach is to consider merger consolidation of three or more MDI credit unions. I would think that the NCUA, wearing a slightly unorthodox hat of matchmaker, could offer introductions to an array of struggling MDIs with compatible fields of membership and relative geographic proximity. At the end of the day, for example, five $100 million MDI credit unions could consolidate into one $500 million MDI institution with economies of scale and market force. As a non, <clears throat> pardon me, as necessary, a non-MDI credit union that offers financial stability together with viable IT and related expertise could join the group, provided the surviving credit union qualifies as an MDI. This is easier said than done as issues regarding the integration of multiple institutions and their systems and cultures, the composition and structure of the continuing management team and the compensation packages to retiring employees will, will require deft, transparent, and inherently fair negotiations and resolutions. The reality as I see it today is that we are going to have far fewer MDI credit unions within the next few years. We can wait on the sidelines and let larger non-MDIs gobble up smaller MDIs like a game of financial Pac-Man or we can work together to help orchestrate the consolidation of MDIs into much larger, more financially stable institutions that are committed to serving minority communities as financially formidable MDI credit unions. I strongly encourage the NCUA to consider these ideas as we work to address the best approaches to preserving minority depository institutions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions. Great. Thank you, Board Member McWaters, and especially for those really sound recommendations. I do believe that there are things we should explore because like you and Board Member Harper, I certainly believe in the important role that MDIs play, especially our credit unions. You all, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how our MDIs have really stepped up to the plate when it comes to helping small business owners have access to the PPP loans really pleased with the MDIs that I've been speaking with, that they have all been energized and engaged with the program. And one particular MDI that's in Mississippi, they were able to make over 1,000 PPP loans for a median loan amount of $13,000. And one loan was significant in that it was awarded to a historically black college there in the state of Mississippi. So when I say that our MDIs are doing yeoman's work and promoting financial inclusion, they are doing just that. It's evidenced, again, by that one particular credit union in Mississippi. I wish I could talk about what the other 513 are doing. Pamela, again, thank you for your remarks this morning, and you all in closing around this topic. My great hope is that we can take the pain, the anger, and frustration that we've seen over the last several weeks and direct that toward true constructive change. I can think of a few industries that are better positioned to transform those ideas into action than the credit union industry. It is in times of challenge such as these that the credit union mantra of people helping people is revealed to be something much more than a slogan. It, for me and for all of you, is a plan for action. So again, Pamela, thank you. Second item on our agenda today is a board briefing on the NCUA Guaranteed Notes Oversight Program. I appreciate coordinating with Board Member Harper's office and adding today's briefing to the agenda. Staff presenting, Keith Morton, Regional Director of the Southern Region and President of AMAC. Eugene Sheed, Acting Chief Financial Officer, and Anthony Capetta, NGN Supervisor from the Office of Examination and Insurance. Good morning, all of you. Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Hood. This is Anthony Capetta. Uh, good morning, Board Member McWaters and Board Member Harper. Keith Eugene and I are here today to provide you an update on the NCUA Guaranteed Note Program. The asset management estates, the five failed corporates, as well as information on an un upcoming interim distribution for Southwest Corporates Capital Note Holders. We will post this slide presentation as well as our prepared remarks on the NCUA website. We've included throughout the slide deck links 
to where details and supporting information, such as various schedules, tables, videos, and FAQs already exist that address what we are covering today. The majority of, today, of the information in today's presentation is based on preliminary and unaudited Q1 2020 data. However, the AME data used for determining the interim distribution uses NCUA's audited year-end 2019 financials, as you'll see noted on several slides. It is important to note that the information and projections we are providing today represent point-in-time estimates, as of the dates noted on the slide. Much of the information is generated using projected cash flows for the legacy assets, that is, the securities from the, from the failed corporate credit unions that were resecuritized in the NGNs, and are subject to change. The future cash flows of the legacy assets are projected by BlackRock based on proprietary models that can see the key macroeconomic factors such as housing prices, interest rates, and unemployment level, as well as a wide variety of current characteristics and historical performance variables at the asset level. NCUA will receive these projected cash flows over time, but they have not been realized and they could vary significantly from projections. Slide, please. So with that, we will start with the background information on the overall corporate system resolution program. During the economic crisis, several corporate credit unions had come under severe liquidity and capital pressure in 2008 due to a high concentration of primarily non-residential, non-agency residential mortgage-backed securities. As of 2009, the total unpaid principal balance for these distressed securities was $52.7 billion, but their market value was less than $22 billion. Thus, market losses from these corporates, ultimately five in total, would have exceeded the $30 billion, an amount far in excess of the share insurance funds, then $11 billion balance available to cover losses. We estimated the probable failure of thousands of consumer credit unions with uninsured deposits in these institutions, which would have resulted in a cost of the credit union system estimated at $40 billion. The agency's corporate system resolution program prevented that scenario. Stakeholders will recall that the Corporate System Resolution Program had three key goals, to stabilize, resolve, and reform the corporate system. The extraordinary liquidity support programs put in place during the stabilization fund of the program have all since expired, but the elements of the resolution, but some elements of the resolution phase remain, specifically the NCUA Guaranteed Note, or NGN program, and the five asset management estates, one for each of the failed corporate credit unions. Slide, please. At its open meeting on September 24, 2010, the NCUA board announced the resolution phase of the Corporate System Resolution Program. To facilitate the resolution, there was an initial sale of about $10 billion in securities that were highly marketable and trading close to par, as well as an unwind of about $25 billion notional in derivatives so as to unencumber the legacy assets for resecuritization. Resolution of the five corporate credit unions employed a good bank, bad bank approach that led to the creation of the five asset management estates and four temporary bridge corporate credit unions, which have since been closed once operational transition for the affected credit unions was achieved. NCOA created a resecuritization program to provide long-term funding for the legacy assets through the issuance of NGNs by trusts established for this purpose. With the issuance of the NGNs, NCOA transferred the associated legacy assets into the respective NGN trusts. The NGNs are guaranteed by the NCUA and backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. The NGN program began with its first deal issued in October 2010 and the last deal issued in June 2011. Other milestones include complete repayment of $5.1 billion in U.S. Treasury borrowings in October 2016 and the early closure of the Temporary Corporate Credit Union Stabilization Fund in October 2017. In terms of future milestones, the last NGN will mature on June 12th of 2021, after which we will complete an orderly liquidation of the remaining legacy assets, close the AMEs, and distribute funds to stakeholders following the payout priorities. Note that there is no end date on the timeline. That is principally because, as I will show and discuss later in the presentation, at the last NGN's maturity in June of 20, 
21, NCUA will have a significant amount of post-securitized legacy assets that will remain to be monetized. NCUA will monetize these legacy assets seeking to obtain full and fair value for stakeholders as market conditions permit through an orderly liquidation. As there is no way to determine what future market conditions will exist at that time or when full and fair value for the assets will be attainable, we project the program will likely continue into 2022. Slide, please. NCUA issued a total of 13 NGNs with several of the deals having multiple tranches. Ultimately, 18 series of notes for a total proceeds raised of $28.3 billion were issued. All of the NGNs but the 2011 M1 deal amortized based on the paydown of the underlying legacy assets. The 2011 M1 deal was a series of five bullet payments, four of which have been paid. The amount of the assets securitized from each of the failed corporates that are in each, in each NGN are shown in the table. All five AMEs have legacy assets in the last NGN that matures in June of 2021. The NGNs were backed by a variety of security types, predominantly non-agency residential mortgage-backed securities, and, have all, and all have hard final maturities of 10 years or less. This was done to achieve better execution and pricing for the deal offerings and to ensure that NCUA's guarantee obligation associated with the NGNs did not extend beyond the life of the stabilization fund. Slide, please. Slide five provides some high-level statistics on the current status of the NGNs and the associated legacy assets. In terms of trends, we use Q4 2011 as a reference point as it is the first year for which all NGNs had been issued which provides a comparable basis for totaling outstanding balances and so forth. Adding up the nominal amounts at, a particular, at the time a particular NGN was issued, we actually securitized over $40 billion of legacy assets with total pre proceeds raised through the NGN sales of $28.3 billion. As of Q4 2011, the total legacy asset unpaid principal balance across all NGNs was $34.3 billion. As of Q1 2020, this has declined to $5.8 billion, primarily from principal paydowns and defaults on the legacy assets. You can see in the realized legacy asset losses line that $9.5 billion of realized losses have occurred to date, with total remaining losses estimated to be another $100 to $200 million, which means that the vast majority of expected losses have already been realized. NCUA uses cash flows projected by BlackRock, this BlackRock discounted at the applicable funding rate to estimate the net realizable value of legacy assets associated with the NGN program. The net realizable value was $24.5 billion as of Q4 2011, with a market value of $19.3 billion. This was backing $24.7 billion in outstanding balances owed to the NGN investors. As of Q1 2020, the net realizable and market values of the legacy assets are $4.2 billion and $4.1 billion, respectively, <clears throat> on an unpaid principal balance of $5.8 billion, backing $2.6 billion owed to the NGN investors. So on both a net realizable and market value basis, there is approximately 160% over-collateralization currently in the deals. Slide six, please. This slide shows the projected maturity dates and associated guarantee payments for the remaining NGNs. The NGNs are guaranteed by NCUA and backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, and these guarantees provide for timely interest and ultimate principal at maturity of the NGN notes, and they were necessary for NCUA to issue the NGNs during the height of the Great Recession in 2010 and 2011 when the capital markets were in turmoil. These guarantees provide that if an NGN deal reaches its maturity date and does not have sufficient cash within the trust to pay off the remaining balance of the note, notes due investors, NCUA must supplement the trust and satisfy the NGN note's final principal payment. Of the 13 original deals, seven deals, or 10 series, have matured to date, and six deals, or eight series, remain outstanding. Only seven of the remaining eight series are expected to require a guarantee payment from NCUA at maturity. Because the legacy assets in certain NGN series performed much better than expected, six of the 10 NGN series have paid off naturally, that is before their hard final maturities. 
and none of these notes required NCUA to make get any guaranteed payments. For the four NGN series that did not mature naturally, NCUA exercised an optional call provision within the deals to purchase some collateral from the trust one month before the maturity and pay off the outstanding notes. Then, using fiduciary cash and, when necessary, borrowed money from the share insurance fund, the outstanding notes principal was paid, the trust was collapsed, collapsed, and the underlying collateral was sold off to pay any advance from the share insurance fund, effectively making the guarantee payment. The remaining eight NGN series mature in Q4 2020, Q1 2021, and Q2 2021. For all but two of them, we will utilize this one month early call provision that I just discussed. Noted on the chart is the projected guarantee payment for each outstanding NGN note, with the exception of NGN 2011-R33A, which is not expected to require a guarantee payment. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the details and amounts related to the graphs on slide six. In total, NCUA expects to make approximately $1.9 billion more in guarantee payments through the end of the program and June of 2021. The last NGN deal does not hit its final maturity until then, on June 12, 2021. Moreover, after, these, after all of these remaining trusts mature, we project that we will have an additional 610 underlying legacy assets amounting to approximately $2.9 billion in unpaid principal balance that we will ultimately need to sell. And speaking of sales, next slide, please. This slide provides a summary of our sales to date and the remaining legacy assets that we project that will need to be sold. NCUA began an orderly liquidation of assets in February 2017, soon after the first NGN note matured naturally and has successfully executed 21 auctions since then, essentially entering the market every month up through February 2020, just before the current COVID-19 crisis began to impact the market. These auctions are held in a bid wanted in competition format among 34 broker dealers of various sizes and abilities to ensure that we reach the breadth and depth of the market and obtain the best execution for the sales. Our auctions have resulted in over 23 different broker dealers purchasing legacy assets at full and fair market value. NCUA executes these auctions directly with the market to avoid paying fees to outside parties and maximize returns to stakeholders. To date, we sold 428 bonds, averaging roughly 20 per sale, with an unpaid principal balance or face value of $3.3 billion, realizing $2.8 billion in sales proceeds with an average sales price at approximately 7% above our net realizable value or book price. Given the current COVID-19 crisis, we have suspended the auction sales, and as we are not forced sellers, and we are seeking to obtain full and fair value for the assets. The bottom table shows the numbers and amounts of bonds that remain to be sold, currently both securitized and post-securitized by the program's end. Next slide, please. This table shows the total gross and net corporate system resolution costs, as well as how that cost is broken out between federally insured credit unions and depleted corporate capital holders. As of Q1 2020, the projected lifetime legacy asset losses range from $9.6 to $9.7 billion, as shown here and back on slide five. Due to the guarantee fees charged, uh, charged to insure the NGNs and beneficial excess interest from the underlying legacy assets, we expect $1.1 to $1.2 billion to offset the lifetime losses, resulting in a total gross projected resolution cost of $8.4 to $8.6 billion. Thus, in addition to preventing losses and stabilizing the credit union system, the corporate system resolution program, including the NGM program, provided beneficial excess interest and guarantee fees that, and preserved the rights to what ended up being several billion dollars in le additional legal recoveries. After accounting for direct legal recoveries received, the total net costs range from $4.6 to $4.8 billion. We have exhausted most of the legal recovery avenues, but there are still outstanding repurchase and trustee cases, resulting in legal holes for many of the post-securitized assets on the previous slide. And with that, I will now turn it over to Keith to talk about the AMEs and the flip side of these costs, that is the projected recovery to corporate capital holders and the planned interim distribution. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. 
Uh, this is Keith Morton, Regional Director and AMAC President. As you're aware, the Asset Management Assistance Center is charged with the administration of the asset management estates of failed corporate credit unions. Anthony mentioned something in his opening remarks that I believe bears repeating. At the height of the crisis in 2009, market losses from the five failed corporates would have exceeded $30 billion, or approximately 270% of the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund, then $11 billion balance. Generally accepted accounting principles required credit losses to be recorded on the respective corporate credit union's books, threatening the solvency of the failed five corporates. The NCUA's multifaceted corporate system resolution program has been extremely effective at protecting the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund and reducing resolution costs while enabling the agency to aggressively pursue legal recoveries. A case in point, the total projected corporate resolution costs has decreased from the original 2010 midpoint estimate of $15 billion to $8.5 billion as of March 31, 2020. And after considering net legal recoveries of $3.8 billion, the midpoint of net projected resolution costs now stands at $4.5 billion, a reduction of 70% from original estimates. At the outset of the NGN program, our projections indicated the members of the failed corporates would not receive any recoveries for depleted capital. However, the success of the program to date has positioned the liquidating agent for the failed corporate asset management estates to consider making distributions to the former capital holders of certain failed corporates. More specifics on that later. Keep in mind that cash recoveries enable respective estates to pay liquidation expenses and claims against the estate. We are pleased to report that due to the performance of the program, as just outlined by Anthony, we project that the former capital holders of U.S. Central, Members United, Southwest, and Constitution will collectively receive distributions of approximately $2.5 billion starting next month with a distribution to the former capital holders of Southwest Corporate, as they are the only estate currently with sufficient cash on hand to make a meaningful distribution at this time. Slide 11, please. This slide depicts how Part 709 of the NCUA Rules and Regulations govern AMAC's administration of the asset management estates. Starting on the left, we show the priority of payment as defined by the regulation. In paying out insured shares, expenses of the liquidation, and NGN program costs, the share insurance fund became the claimant under steps B1, 4, 6, and 6.5. With respect to U.S. Central, Members United, and Southwest Corporate, all claims except for provisioned liquidating expenses and anticipated NGN guarantee payments have been paid up to the B6 level. West Corps is projected to not be able to repay the insurance fund's $2.2 billion, which falls under the B4 level, and thus we do not project any recoveries to West Corps former capital holders in any scenario. Constitution owes $1 million in estimated liquidation expenses at the B1 level and uh, $23 million to the NCUA at the B6 level, and we anticipate additionally they will owe guarantee fees before any capital can be distributed to its former capital holders. Please note the payout priority shown as B7 and B9. That is where membership capital uh, and paid in capital accounts from the former capital holders of the failed corporate's claims reside. Slide 12, please. At this point, I should pause to issue some standard caveats and disclaimers about these projections. All projected values are point in time estimates. Economic and or market conditions that involve greater volatility in one or more factors used to project realized values as compared to those that uh, the stress scenarios modeled can lead to less than projected recoveries. Extraordinary losses on the legacy assets due to exogenous factors may result in higher than anticipated guaranteed payments from NCUA. 
On slide 12, you can see that it is now projected in all scenarios, the estates of U.S. Central, Members United, and Southwest Corporates will each have funds available to repay some portion of member capital after anticipated cash flows are run through the applicable NGN waterfalls and then applied to the payout priority categories for each estate. Repayment of U.S. Central member capital will include a distribution to the other four states that had capital at U.S. Central. You'll notice the projections are made under several scenarios derived from BlackRock projections, and the adverse scenario represents a moderate recession. Slide 13, please. On slide 13, you'll note based on the projected availability of funds at the end of the program, in considering necessary provisions for senior claims in the payment priority for each estate, we now project former members of Southwest Corporate will recover 100% of their member capital shares, even under the adverse scenario, and that former members United and USC members are projected to receive a majority of their membership capital shares. Constitution is projected to receive 54% under the base scenario, but projections drop to 14% under the adverse scenario. As previously mentioned, West Corp members are not projected to receive a distribution under any scenario. Slide 14. The performance of the legacy assets and projected availability of funds has led us to consider whether potential interim distributions are appropriate. As liquidating agent, AMEC would only make distributions to two depleted capital holders once senior claims are fully paid or provisioned, and only if fiduciary cash for the given estate is available to make the payments. All five of the estates have projected guarantee obligations through June of 2021 that represent senior claims that must be provided for. Only one estate, Southwest Corporate, has sufficient fiduciary cash as of the end of year end 2019 to provide for its future obligations and pay a meaningful amount of funds to member capital holders in 2020. Two of the estates, U.S. Central and Members United, have cash that can be used to partially satisfy future obligations. And, um, slide 15, please. The next two slides show the breakout of the published fiduciary tables on our website. Slide 15 shows the asset management of state's fiduciary net assets for the five corporates. Highlighted are several components which are fundamental in the calculation of a distribution. I draw your attention to the column for Southwest Corporate it is, as it is the only estate with sufficient fiduciary cash as of year in 2019 to provide for its future guarantee obligation and pay a meaningful amount of funds to member capital holders in 2020. First, the $266.6 million in the top red highlight represents cash and cash equivalents held on deposit by the AME. These funds are held by the AME and not by the share insurance fund. The lower highlighted box indicates $2.5 million in accrued expenses and payable, which includes the estimated future liquidation costs of Southwest Corporate AME. Slide 16, please. This slide shows the NGN Trust net fiduciary assets, again, for the five corporates. I again, draw your attention to the several highlighted numbers under the column for Southwest. These numbers and those on slide 15 are the source of the summary calculation shown on the next slide. The $131.9 million and the $49 million represent funds held by the NGN trustee. The numbers are reported separately because the $49 million is invested in Treasury securities supporting the NGN 2011-M1 Trust. Together, these items equal $181 million in Southwest corporate assets held by the NGN trustee. Southwest corporate AME also has NGN liabilities at December 31, which include a half a million dollars in accrued expenses and payables related to accrued NGN expense and accrued NGN interest expense and $273 million in outstanding notes, $273.1 million, excuse me. Slide 17, please. Based on data from December 31, 2019 audited financials, the liquidating agent currently has the capability to make an interim distribution of $171 million, 
which would provide depleted Southwest corporate membership capital holders with a recovery of approximately 42% of their $403.5 million in depleted membership capital based on those audited financials and in accordance with our standard operating procedure, we plan to make the distribution. In 2021, we will perform the same annual analysis with audited year-end financials for 2020 to determine if additional interim distributions are appropriate and will continue to do so annually thereafter until the cases are canceled. I'll now turn it over to Eugene, who will discuss the upcoming distribution. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Slide 18 provides information about the interim distribution. The NCOA issued claim receipt certificates to member capital account holders in 2010. At that time, the Southwest Corporate Estate had around 1,120 account holders with a total claim of $403.5 million. Through mergers, acquisitions, purchases, and liquidations, there are about 900 remaining active account holders who will receive a share of the $171 million interim payout. Our plan is to send a letter to these 900 remaining account holders within the next week, notifying them of the amount and other payment details. Information will also be posted on NCUA's website. Distribution of the capital recovery is anticipated to occur in July. We have EFT information for most account holders and we will use that information for the distribution. For other recipients, we'll work to obtain any needed additional information. I now turn it back over to Keith. Yes, thank you, Eugene. Again, this is Keith Morton, and that concludes our presentation, Chairman Hood, and we'd be glad to answer any questions you or the other board members may have. Thank you. Great. Well, well, gentlemen, first and foremost, thank you for your presentation this morning. It was really insightful and very detailed. I greatly appreciate it. Before we get into the substance of my comments, I first want to recognize the NGN Oversight Committee and Anthony Capetta's staff for the great work done to maximize recoveries in the NGN program, as well as the good work done by Keith and Eugene's staff in administering the affairs and financials of the asset management estates. The good news you provided today of a partial distribution to the capital account holders and the possibility of future dividends would have seemed like an impossibility when the agency was first confronted with the corporate crisis following the 2007-2008 global financial crisis. When the NCRA established the Corporate System Resolution Program in 2010, managing to the least long-term costs consistent with sound public policy was one of the core principles established by the NCUA board. Under the leadership of Chairman Debbie Matz, NCUA first assessed the value of all assets in the failed corporate credit unions. Second, to the extent possible, NCUA sold those assets that were highly marketable and for which good value could be obtained, such as agency-backed securities, loans, and other miscellaneous investments. Third, NCUA implemented a strategy to address the largest group of assets, referred to as the legacy assets. In order to protect credit unions from realizing the full market loss of the legacy assets at liquidation, NCUA implemented the NGN program, which resecuritized those investments, provided the cash needed to facilitate the liquidations of the failed corporate credit unions, and avoided a loss to the taxpayers. Today's briefing is indeed a success story culminating from the efforts of NCUA and credit union leadership during those difficult times. This is really a shared victory. The credit union movement can be proud of its resilience and commitment demonstrated to the system of cooperative credit. While the NCUA leadership and staff can take pride in efficiently managing these assets to maximize recovery. Before I move to my questions, I want to note that the NCUA website updates on the Southwest distribution will be housed on the Corporate System Resolution section of the NCUA website. I'll repeat, I want to note that the NCUA website updates on the Southwest distribution will be housed on the Corporate System Resolution section of the NCUA website. 
It will be updated shortly after the conclusion of today's meeting. Now, gentlemen, I do have a few questions. Keith, during your presentation and in our briefing a few days ago, you noted that this distribution is part of the liquidating agent's normal operating procedure. I believe this is an important point. Can you elaborate a little on this procedure and how you determine there are funds available to pay the claim holders? Yes, Chairman, this is Keith Morton again. Uh, each corporate estate is valued quarterly and annually using audited financial statements, we take a deeper look to see where our actual coveries stand. As you know, we cannot distribute non-monetized assets or investments to creditors and claim holders, only cash. We evaluate whether cash recoveries are sufficient to pay all bills and claims. We determine which claims receive priority consistent with NQA rules and regulations, section 709. We determine how much actual cash we have in the bank, what bills and claims must still be paid, including any guarantees owned, owed related to the NGN program, and ultimately determine how much cash can be paid out to creditors and claim holders without jeopardizing ongoing operation of the liquidation estate. From that information, we make a determination of what creditor levels can be paid and to what extent within that level. As of December 2019, using audited financial statements, we determined that this distribution would meet our normal distribution criteria and available funds have reached a level which will result in a meaningful distribution to claim holders. Thank you for the question. Great, and thank you for the response. I often have people ask me from time to time about the reported recoveries on our website, and I'm sure some people may look at the high level of those recoveries and ask, why can't we distribute, distribute more than we are at this point in time? So can someone speak to that? Again, why can't we distribute more than we are at this particular point in time? Yes, Chairman, this is Keith Morton. I'll, I'll handle that as well. The website reflects total projected recoveries, which we, we rely on, uh, which rely on the maturing of NCUA guaranteed notes, payment of associated guarantees, and the orderly monetization of assets. Thus, distributions are based on unencumbered cash. At this point, we only have a sufficient cash level to make a meaningful distribution to the former members of Southwest Corporate. As I mentioned, we plan to recalculate available funds at year-end 2020 year, using year-end audited financials, which are typically available by the end of February. NCUA's current projections are subject to change as the underlying investments are made up of private label mortgage-backed securities. The value of these securities and the ability to monetize them at fair value is primarily driven by the market, which is outside NCUA's control. Should there be a downturn in our investment recoveries due to COVID-19 or other factors, our projections will decrease and we may find that we are unable to make payments to the levels currently projected. As you noted in your opening remarks back in 2020, 10, 20, 10, excuse me, we did not believe based on projections and economic conditions at that time that we would ever be able to make a distribution uh, with respect to any case. Thank you, Chairman. Great, thank you. And one last question. Can any of you please explain how does this payout affect the capital ratio or health of the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund? For members of the public who may be watching today, I'm sure that's the question that could arise. Yes, sir, Chairman, this is Keith again. It will have no impact. As we converted the assets to cash, we moved down the waterfall I discussed earlier in this slide presentation. The share insurance fund has been fully repaid for losses and the liquidation expenditures made on behalf of the Southwest Corporate Liquidation Estate. Cash recoveries on hand, which are available to pay membership capital and paid in capital claim holders are moved to a separate account outside of the share insurance fund as the share insurance fund has no legal right to the funds. Therefore, as the funds are accumulated, they do not accrue to the benefit of the share insurance fund, and when they are paid out, they do not subtract from the assets of the fund. Importantly, these funds are not intermingled with the agency's other funds, the share insurance fund or the central liquidity facility fund. Instead, they belong to the claimants and creditors of the respective asset management estates. And thank you for your question, sir. Great, thank you. I have no further questions. I'd now like to recognize board member Harper. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you for scheduling this briefing as I requested on the NCUA Guaranteed Notes Program and the status of the failed corporate credit union asset management estates. While we regularly update the agency's web pages with information about these estates and the performance of the NCUA Guaranteed Notes, it's good from time to time to have a public discussion about these matters. Transparency is a principle of good government and I am pleased that we are providing such transparency today. And Keith, Eugene, and Anthony, thank you for today's presentation and for your longstanding and ongoing work related to resolving the corporate credit unions that failed during the Great Recession. You and your teams have much for which to be proud. Please let everyone on your teams know that I am very appreciative of their hard work. It has taken more than a decade to get to today's announcement about beginning to make distributions to the capital account holders at one of the failed corporate credit union asset management estates. It's often said that success has many parents, but failure is an orphan. That is very true. Here at the NCUA, the success in minimizing the costs and maximizing the proceeds of the corporate resolution can be attributed to the actions of many. I'd like to highlight a few of those individuals today. I remember very well when I worked on Capitol Hill when our now Executive Director Larry Fazio first briefed me on the need to create the Temporary Corporate Credit Union Stabilization Fund. I also remember when then Chairman Mike Frizel testified before the House Financial Services Committee on the issue. Under Chairman Frizel's initial direction and then the subsequent leadership of Chairman Matt, Metzger, and Nick Waters, the agency worked diligently to implement and refine its corporate resolution strategy, and that continues today under Chairman Hood. Former Executive Director Mark Trichel, who is retiring at the end of the month, also led efforts to conserve the two largest corporate credit unions and later guided the sale and securitization of $28 billion in NCUA guaranteed notes. The NCUA guaranteed notes have been essential to the successful least cost resolution of the corporate credit union crisis. The decision to pursue litigation against the Wall Street firms that sold faulty mortgage-backed securities is also a key reason why we are now able to make this initial distribution and why we might be able to make additional distributions in the future. As both the conservator and liquidating agent for each of the five failed corporate credit unions, the NCUA board has a fiduciary responsibility to collect debt and obligations owed the corporate credit unions. That duty includes using reasonably available legal means to seek recoveries from parties that contributed to the corporate credit union losses. Initially, many said that the lawsuits would be a fruitless path to follow because the Wall Street securities firms had never lost a case. Nevertheless, with the help of outside counsel, the NCUA became the first federal financial institutions regulator to sue and recover losses from investments in these securities on behalf of the five failed institutions. To date, as liquidating agent, the NCUA board has filed more than two dozen complaints in federal courts in New York, Kansas, and California against more than 30 defendants. In all, the NCUA has recovered more than $5.1 billion from Wall Street firms. And the agency has used the net proceeds from these recoveries to pay claims against the five failed corporate credit unions, including those of the Temporary Corporate Credit Union Stabilization Fund. As we work to wind down the remaining NCUA guaranteed notes and wrap up the outstanding lawsuits, we must continue to minimize the costs and maximize the returns. Doing so will allow us to return more money to federally insured credit unions holding capital notes in the asset management of states of the failed corporate credit unions. In turn, those credit unions can use those net proceeds to make needed loans to their members, including the millions of credit union members who have experienced declines in income and economic hardship because of the coronavirus pandemic. Before I close, I do have two questions. First, Anthony, I'd like to start uh, at, with the bottom row on slide five. Looking back over time, the projected lifetime legacy asset losses have improved considerably during the last decade. What accounts for that improvement? Uh, yes, Board Member Harper, this is Anthony Capetta. Uh, projected lifetime legacy asset losses are lower than original estimates due to primarily three factors. The first was a much better than expected recovery in the housing market. 
I don't think anybody at the time envisioned the housing market would respond like it did. A sustained low interest rate environment and also the indirect legal recoveries, and that is those that benefited the trust like global settlements of ResCap and Lehman Brothers, as well as those that NCUA undertook as guarantor to pursue claims like breach of reps and warranties, reps and warranties by the mortgage originator or servicer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Today's announcement is welcome news for the nearly 900 active credit unions holding certificates in the Southwest Corporate Asset Management Estate. We, however, can expect questions about when the NCUA might issue distributions to other asset management estates. Keep your presentation on slides 12 and 13 outline the possible amounts available under different economic scenarios and the likelihood of a distribution for each of the asset management estates. I'd like to know with some more specificity about the timing for the NCUA to make future decisions on these matters. In other words, when should credit unions expect possible distributions, if any? Yes, thank you, Board Member Harper. I appreciate the question. Uh, this is Keith Morton again. Uh, the liquidating agent has developed standard operating procedures for this process. Uh, further, the liquidating agent will use audited year-end financials, which are typically available by February 28th of each calendar year. So we will repeat this process again, the process that's shown on slide 17 um, next uh, year, first quarter of 2021, using audited financials. The calculation will be, will be performed for each corporate asset management estate, and distributions will be made based on the availability of sufficient cash to cover the estate's liabilities, including any guarantee payments made on the estate's um, behalf by the share insurance fund. Due to the various uh, variables and unknowns that uh, we alluded to in this presentation, market conditions and the like, I'm not able to give any greater specificity at this time as to when or, or how much a distribution we made other than to say that we will re-perform the calculation in February of next year. And if a meaningful uh, amount of funds exist, we will make distributions to those former members and former capital holders. Thank you again Thank for the you. question. Thank you, Keith. That's, that's a very helpful uh, set of piece of information for credit unions going forward. And also thank you to Anthony and Eugene for your presentations today. Mr. Chairman, I have no further remarks at this time. Thank you, Board Member Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Keith, Eugene, and Anthony for your presentation today. It's important to know that the possibility of making distributions to the former members of the felt corporate credit unions, U.S. Central, West Corps, Members United, Southwest, and Constitution, as outlined on our NCUA website, arose from the prescient actions of past NCUA board members and agency staff. During the financial crisis of 2008-2009, NCUA Chair Mike Frizzell worked to design and develop the policies and infrastructure of the NCUA Guaranteed Notes Program and the mortgage-backed securities lawsuits that laid the cornerstone for these potential distributions. Without the NGN Program and the MBS lawsuits, it is unlikely that in any of the recent past or projected distributions would occur. NCUA Chair Debbie Madsen worked diligently to further design, develop, and implement these policies, programs, and lawsuits. <clears throat> During my chairmanship, Rick, uh, NCUA Chair Rick Metzger and I merged the Temporary Corporate Credit Union Stabilization Fund into the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund, thereby permitting, without premium assessment to any credit union, one, the payment of nearly $900 million in distributions to credit unions, two, the funding of over $700 million in reserves for credit union losses, and three, the dramatic improvement in the safety and soundness of the share insurance fund. Most importantly, AMAC and other NCUA staff members have worked tirelessly for over a decade to implement these NCUA board policies and prudently manage the assets held in the corporate management estates. 
I wish to express my sincere thanks to my former board colleagues and the NCUA staff, particularly Sarah Vega, Mike Radway, Steve Bozak, Mark Trichel, John Cutchy, Larry Fazio, Rendell Jones, and Keith Morton, among many others, for their vision and wisdom in staying the course when others were calling for the agency to fire sell the corporate assets and refrain from wasting time and resources on frivolous lawsuits. These so-called pundits were way off the mark. I am pleased that my tenure on the NCUA board has lasted long enough to witness the fruits of the labor of those who have come before me. It is my hope that the agency will begin making distributions to the former members of the fellow corporate as soon as it is prudently and legally possible and will continue the distributions until the funds are exhausted. Today, during the pandemic, the former corporate members would no doubt welcome any such distributions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you and Board Member Harper covered the questions that I would have asked, so thank you very much. Great, thank you, Board Member McWaters. The third item on our agenda today is request for information, strategies for future examination and supervision, utilizing digital technology. Staff presenting, Myra Tepe, Acting Director, Office of Examination and Insurance, and Heather Phelps, Program Analysis Officer, Office of Examination and Insurance. Good morning, ladies, and welcome. Good morning, Chairman Hood. This is Myra Tepe. Um, also, good morning to Board Member Harper and Board Member McWaters. Heather Phelps and I are here today to ask for your approval of a Request for Information, or RFI, on strategies for modernizing our examination and supervision program through the use of digital technology. This RFI has an extensive number of questions related to how the NCUA can utilize technology in our future examination process. This RFI is part of a multi-phase project of our virtual examination program that is outlined, I'm sorry, outlined on the agency's website at ncua.gov. I will now turn it over to Heather Phelps to discuss the history of the future examination modernization initiatives and details about this request for information. Good morning, this is Heather Phelps, and thank you, Myra, for that introduction. One of the agency's examination modernization initiatives is the virtual examination program. Because this program was initiated several years ago, I would like to start with a brief history of the efforts that have paved the road for this program. In May of 2016, the NCUA board established the Exam Flexibility Initiative Internal Working Group to evaluate the agency's examination and supervision program. This working group sought input from credit unions and others to obtain opinions and advice regarding the existing examination and supervision program. In late 2016, this working group provided the NCUA board with 10 recommendations to consider. One of these recommendations encouraged the agency to evaluate alternative approaches to our current examination program by seeking ways to reduce our on-site presence. Consistent with the NCUA board promoting modernizing the examination program and reducing our on-site presence at credit at credit unions, the Flexible Examination Program, commonly, commonly referred to as FLEX, was piloted in 2017 to assess the examiner's ability to work remotely on elements of the examination. On average, this pilot resulted in examiners being able to reduce their time on site by 30%. In November of 2017, the NCUA board approved funding for the virtual examination, exploration, and research. And in 2018, the virtual exam program was established. The virtual exam program is part of a series of interrelated programs to transform the agency's operations to meet core mission objectives. Currently, the program is in the research and discovery phase. During this phase, the team is researching ways the agency can harness new and emerging data assess advancements in analytical techniques, and utilize innovative technology. Additionally, the team is identifying ways to improve its supervisory approach and move to a more virtual-based examination model in the next five to 10 years. Through modernization, the NCUA intends to reduce the burden on credit unions, improve off-site supervision and capabilities, 
and provide more consistency and standardization for the examination and supervision process. In addition, we want to explore and evaluate technology utilization and the industry's interest in adopting technology. The key to success of our modernization initiatives is ongoing communication and transparency. Therefore, we are seeking input on our future examination model as part of our research and discovery phase for this project. We would like approval to publish a notice in the Federal Register for a 60-day comment period asking a series of questions on the ways to design and implement the future examination model. We would also ask about the challenges and possible regulatory restrictions with leveraging technology. We believe that these questions, while there are many, take into account consumer financial protection, financial education, barriers for using or implementing technology, possible impacts from reducing our on-site presence during examinations, and information credit unions could provide to help facilitate our modernization efforts. Commenters are also encouraged to discuss any other relevant issues they believe the NCUA should consider with respect to this examination study. We anticipate the responses will allow us to make informed decisions when developing and designing the future exam model. This concludes our remarks, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Well, thank you for your presentation. Speaking of the public's perspective on these issues should provide valuable insight. I am delighted that we're taking strides in researching ways to modernize our examination and supervision functions. Since my time as Vice Chairman at NCUA a decade ago and continuing into my chairmanship, I've reiterated my priority to reduce burdensome regulations by making regulations effective but not excessive. However, as we look to the future of our examination and supervision program, it's important that while we hope examiners will be able to use more technology and reduce on-site presence, examiners must still have a presence on-site to prohibit unsafe and unsound practices in credit unions. It will be imperative that we find and strike that right and delicate balance. As I mentioned earlier today, one of my priorities is to explore ways to meet the needs of unbanked and underbanked Americans who lack reliable access to quality, accessible, and affordable financial services. Therefore, I strongly encourage low-income designated credit unions and minority depository institutions to provide comments and feedback on your perspective with respect to this initiative. We welcome your input as we strive to support your efforts in providing financial services to your member owners. I now, ladies, have a few questions. What have we learned from examinations during the COVID-19 pandemic, and how can we apply it to this initiative going forward? This is Heather Phelps. I would be happy to answer that question for you. In response to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, the agency moved to an off-site posture on March 16, 2020. Since then, examiners have worked with credit union staff to facilitate the secure exchange of information needed to conduct off-site examinations and supervision functions. What we've learned is examiners were able to perform many elements of the examination program that would have otherwise been performed on-site at the credit union. The adaptive response by both the examiners and the credit unions provides that more work can be conducted off-site. The results, based on my preliminary review of off-site work that's been performed by the examiners, has surpassed my initial assumptions for the virtual exam program. I plan to thoroughly review the examinations that were completed during the pandemic and incorporate the lessons learned into the final virtual exam program. That concludes my answer. Oh, great. Thank you. I do just have one final question. You've mentioned that one of the goals of the strategies for future examinations using digital technology is to reduce some of the burden credit unions experience from our on-site presence during their exams. How much time is currently spent on-site during examinations? And what's our goal uh, with the new virtual examination program? This is Heather Phelps. Um, so before moving to an off-site posture as a, res as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, examiners spent approximately 83% of the total exam hours on-site at credit unions. Although we anticipate in future exams that we will always maintain an on-site presence, we feel confident that the time we are on site could be significantly reduced. If a credit union is able to provide documents electronically using a secure method, such as 
such as a secure me method, areas such as reviewing board minutes, reviewing audits from third parties, performing analytics on the credit union, um, and many other areas could be done remotely. Therefore, on-site exam activities could be reduced. Um, we don't have a goal per se on the amount of time that we would reduce our on-site presence. Rather, the goal is to reduce the burden on credit unions um, and, to, and to, for us to maintain our effectiveness Great. while improving our efficiency, whether we are on-site or off-site. In addition to the on-site burden, this future examination model plans to reduce redund redundant requests in the items needed to perform the examination and potentially reduce the timing and frequency of our on-site contacts. And that concludes my comments. Great. Well, thank you. And I have no further questions. I'd like to now recognize Board Member Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Heather and Myra, thank you for your presentation today and for your hard work on developing a virtual examination program at the NCUA. And congratulations, Heather, on your first briefing at the NCUA board table. You did a terrific job. Given the subject matter that we are discussing, it's very fitting that you had to make that presentation virtually using digital technology. The request for information about strategies for future examination and supervision utilizing digital technology that we are considering today is the next step in a process which began in 2016. The agency and the credit unions that we supervise have long contemplated alternative approaches to reducing the agency's on-site presence during examinations. Alas, the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to accelerate our planning from zero to 60 and move to an off-site exam posture essentially overnight. With the uncertainty that surrounds the health ramifications of the novel coronavirus, now is the time to move forward with a virtual exam program. My policy priorities have long included cybersecurity, equity and inclusion, consumer financial protection, and the preservation of small, low-income and minority depository institutions, as well as third-party vendor authority. I also consider the agency's relationship and interactions with state credit union regulators of great importance to our mission. As I reviewed the request for information, I did so through the lens of each of those policy priorities and with an eye towards how virtual exam program at the NCUA would affect the work and interactions with state regulators. I am pleased to see that several of the questions that I suggested earlier this month were added to the request for information. These questions concern cybersecurity, economic inclusion, consumer financial protection, and the preservation of small, low-income, and minority depository institutions. Thank you, Heather and Myra, for incorporating those ideas. I also greatly appreciate the question added about the impact on our state supervisory programs. State regulators are our partners in the credit union supervision system, and we need to heed their advice and develop complementary examination programs. I will support issuing this request for information, and I encourage all stakeholders to weigh in. The more good ideas that we receive, the better the final virtual exam program will be. And since this, the request for information is about a virtual examination program, cybersecurity is a key element of what we will ultimately consider and adopt. I cannot underscore how important it is for us to hear from experts in the cybersecurity community. Thank you again, uh -huh. Heather and Myra, for your good work. Mr. Chairman, I do not have any questions or further comments. Thank you, Board Member Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mara and Heather, for your presentation um, this morning. It is important to note that the NCUA's board members and staff have worked diligently to modernize the agency's examination process over many years. Much credit for these efforts goes to the thoughtful work of former NCUA board chairs, Mike Frazell, Debbie Max and Rick Metzger, who each championed prudent exam modernization while ensuring the safety and soundness of the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund and the credit union system. As far back as the May 19, 2016 NCUA board meeting, now Executive Larry Fazio and I discussed virtual examinations. In my February 2017 remarks to the CUNA, Governmental Affairs Conference, I noted the importance of virtual examinations. 
Also, in the NCUA budget adopted November 2017, we allocated agency resources to the exploration, research, and development of a virtual examination program that we have pursued since that time. Most importantly, NCUA staff members have worked tirelessly over the past several years to develop and implement an examination modernization program with an evolving virtual examination component. I wish to express my sincere thanks to my former board colleagues and the NCUA staff for their contributions to these projects. Exam modernization in general and virtual examinations in particular are not new ideas at the NCUA. I, th I enthusiastically welcome the chair support for these longstanding bipartisan initiatives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you, Board Member McWaters. Is there a motion? Yes, I move that the Board approve publication of the request for information in the Federal Register for a 60-day comment period as attached to the Board Action Memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I second the motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 All those say nay. The ayes have it, and let the record show the motion passed three to zero. Thank you. The fourth item on our agenda today is final rule, technical amendments to NCUA's rules. Staff presenting, Ian Marina, Associate General Counsel from the Office of General Counsel. Good morning, Ian, and welcome. Thank you. This is Ian Morena. Good morning. I am presenting the final rule on technical amendments. This is a direct final rule. It's a routine housekeeping rule that makes no substantive changes to the NCOA's regulations. From time to time, the board issues a technical amendments rule as a final rule. The most recent one was issued in December 2018. Today's technical amendments rule makes housekeeping changes to various parts of the NCUA's regulations. These include matters such as correcting typographical errors, updating website URLs that have become outdated, or correcting office or organization names that have been changed to bring them up to date. The rule document reflects all the changes in the regulatory amendments. If approved by the board, this rule would become effective when published in the Federal Register. And there will be no comment period associated. That concludes my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and for your work on this technical amendments rule. The NCUA is consistently working to improve the clarity, accuracy, and usability of its regulations. While this final rule makes minor, non-substantive changes, it is nevertheless an important rule that demonstrates this agency's commitment to precision and a willingness to review its regulations. Thank you. I have no questions on this matter. I'd like to recognize Board Member Harper. Thank you, Chairman Hood. And Ian, thank you for your presentation. And also thank you to Justin and Hira for your hard work on the technical amendments rule. As noted in the rule summary, the NCUA Board periodically issues a technical amendments rule correcting minor typographical errors, inaccurate legal citations, or superfluous and outdated regulatory provisions throughout the NCUA's regulations. I have reviewed the staff draft of the final rule and concur that these changes do not affect federally insured credit unions in a substantive manner. They update outdated information and web links, fix spelling, spacing, and formatting errors, insert missing words, and provide greater clarity to existing rules. As a former staffer on Capitol Hill who spent a lot of time reviewing legislative and statutory text for technical corrections, I appreciate the thorough and detailed work you all did. To, say, uh, to that I say, a job well done. I will support this final rule, which will help to make the agency's regulations clearer and easier to understand. Mr. Chairman, I have no questions and no additional comments. Great, thank you, Board Member Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also had no questions, but um, like the chair and the board member Harper, I wish to express my thanks for what in a lot of respects is a um, very, very tough job going through and keeping a running tally of this so we can come up with a technical amendment, not every 10 minutes, but every few months. I, I very much appreciate the work. And as a practicing lawyer, over a long period of time, um, trust me, it's, it's tough. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you, Board Member McWaters. Is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Board approve final rule technical amendments to NCUA's rules and regulations as attached to the Board Action Memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? This is Board Member Harper. I second the motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Thank you. The ayes have it and let the record show the motion passed three to zero. Before we conclude today's board meeting, I'd like to make a statement. On behalf of the National Credit Unit Administration, I would like to take a moment to express our sincere gratitude to Executive Director Mark Trichel for his 34 years of dedicated service to this agency and congratulate him on his upcoming and, might I say, well-deserved retirement. Mark has been a tremendous asset to this agency and has made an immeasurable impact on credit unions throughout the country. Since beginning his career at NCUA, he's held various positions, including problem case officer, supervisory examiner, director of special actions, associate regional director, regional director, and acting director of corporate credit unions. In each of these roles, he personified professionalism, leadership, and dedication and support of the nation's system of cooperative credit. As executive director, he modernized the NCUA security program by establishing a dedicated office and a secure communications facility. He also strengthened and advanced the agency's diversity and inclusion program, initiated a program to modernize all core agency IT platforms, and changed the agency's focus to enable more strategic planning and decision making. One of his lasting contributions to the agency includes developing and leading the most comprehensive reorganization ever undertaken by the NCUA. This included consolidating five regions into three, reducing lease office space by 80%, and realigning many internal functions to maximize efficiency. Additionally, he was a key leader in resolving the corporate credit union crisis from 2009 to 2011. Besides having a lead role in conserving the two largest corporate credit unions we've had, he was also responsible for the sale and securitization of $28 billion in NCUA guaranteed notes, which were critical to the successful lease cost resolution. It goes quite simply without saying that he will be sorely missed. As I and many others throughout the NCUA have counted on his guidance, inclusive leadership style, and solid advice over the years. Mark, as you enter a new and exciting chapter of your life, we honor you, we commend your outstanding accomplishments, and hope your retirement will be a time of discovery and fulfillment for you and your family. I'd now like to give my fellow board members an opportunity to recognize you as well. I'd like to begin with you, Board Member Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and moreover, thank you, Mark, for your more than three decades of service at the NCUA. For those who know Mark Trichel well, you can always count on him to identify the perfect quote for any occasion. In the coming months, Mark and his wife, Marie, plan to travel the United States in their new recreational vehicle. As such, I thought I should begin with a quote from Will Rogers, best known as America's cowboy philosopher, who also traveled widely around our country. Rogers once Riley observed, half of our life is spent trying to find something to do with the time we have rushed through life trying to save. Mark, without question, you have had a long and distinguished career at the agency, and you have saved the amount of time that you need to take this to retirement now. 
You have also had the longest tenure of anyone in the office of the executive director. That's a testament to your outstanding policy, management, and leadership skills. What is more, you served as the executive director under four different NCUA chairmen. Chairman Hood just shared his thoughts on your retirement, and Board Member McWaters will offer his observation shortly. But I thought we should also hear today from Chairman Matt and Chairman Metzger, so I reached out to them. Chairman Matt asked that I share how important you were to her during her time at the NCUA. She could always count on your expertise, calming manner, and extraordinary leadership skills to advise her every day. With good reason, you had the respect and an affection of all NCUA staff. She wishes you the best in retirement and can tell you from firsthand experience that even though you will miss all of your friends at the NCUA, there is life, really good life, after the NCUA. Former Chairman Metzger also praised, quote, your calm and reasoned approach to a myriad of difficult situations, unquote, which he said, quote, was always admired. If he had been here today, he would have said, you are now commissioned to do entirely off-site examinations of everywhere in America that that RV of yours will take you. See you on the Oregon Trail. As for me, I am deeply appreciative of the support you provided me when I headed the Office of Public and Congressional Affairs and when I returned to the NCUA as a board member. I will miss your caring heart in supporting the agency's philanthropic efforts and your competitive spirit when it comes to Big Ten sports. Please, please do not ever ask me again to wear a University of Minnesota sweatshirt. I am especially appreciative of your composed and unruffled demeanor, which probably comes from your Midwestern roots. When problems would arise at the agency, I could count on you to provide a steady hand to steer the ship. I also appreciated your deliberateness and your ability to see any path through, no matter how complicated. Under your leadership, as the chairman noted, we have strengthened the agency's security and continuity of government programs, and we also initiated the first comprehensive overhaul of our examination technology in more than two decades. Your efforts were also critical to resolving the corporate credit union crisis and the establishment of the NCUA Guaranteed Notes Program. You can leave the NCUA knowing that you made the credit union system uh, and the agency safer, sounder, and more resilient. I began these remarks by quoting Real Rogers, so it's fitting that I close them with the quote of another Mr. Rogers, Mr. Fred Rogers. Often when you see the end of something, you're at the beginning of something else. Mr. Rogers is absolutely right, Mark. May your retirement be long, healthful, adventurous, and prosperous. May it also be the beginning of something big. Be well, my friends. Thank you, Board Member Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've had the great honor and privilege to work with the Executive Director, Mark Trichel, since I joined the NCUA Board in August 2014. I wish to thank you, Mark, for your much-valued assistance, keen sense of judgment, depth leadership, and compelling integrity over the years. You are hugely respected and much loved within the agency, and that will serve as your enduring legacy. When I think of Mark, I'm reminded of a quote by Jim Rohn. The challenge of leadership is to be strong, but not rude. Be kind, but not weak. Be bold, but not bully. Be thoughtful, but not lazy. Be humble, but not timid. Be proud, but not arrogant. And have humor without folly. And how could I possibly speak of Mark and not include a Dave Matthews lyric. It's crazy, I'm thinking, just knowing that the world is around. And here, I'm dancing on the ground. Am I right side up or upside down? And is this real or am I dreaming? Mark, thank you for your collegiality and friendship over the years. We at the NCUA are better people. And the agency is a better place because of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And again, Mark, thank you. As you can hear, we all recognize the indelible mark you've left at NCUA. You will be missed, 
and we do look forward to recognizing you for a proper send-off at the appropriate time. But today, do know that we do honor you and appreciate all that you've done. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of our agenda today. There being no further business, we are hereby adjourned, unless there's any other business. Chairman? Here. Oh, yes. Chairman Mark Trifle. Yes, you're welcome to speak, if I, Mark. If I could take a minute. Uh, I, I really want to thank you all for your kind words. Uh, they mean more than you can all imagine. Uh, I'm reminded of something a, a long ago retired uh, gentleman, uh, Dan Murphy, said when he departed, and, uh, and it was went something like this, that I'd like to meet the man you just described. It's been an honor to serve uh, NCUA and credit unions for two reasons. As the mission simply cannot be beat, and NCUA staff, which is absolutely, positively the best. In my ten and a half years in OED, uh, it, it's been amazing. Uh, and as the in seven and a half years, it's been an absolute pleasure to serve uh, the, the four NCUA chairmen that have been referred to, and all board members. Uh, all ten years that I spent in OED, I had the pleasure of having Roz Hendricks as my executive assistant, and I, I, I'd be remiss to not mention John Cutchy, who served as my deputy executive director for all seven and a half years of my tenure. He, uh, you could not ask for a better uh, deputy. And as Johnny Cash said, John, you were a good man to ride the river with. Credit unions will be in my blood forever. Uh, lastly, I, I, I'm off, as, as some of you referred to, to new adventures with my wife, from Marie who's been by my side for my entire NCUA journey, and without her uh, love and support, would not have been able uh, to happen. I'll end with a quote uh, from the, the wise philosopher Dave Matthews, who said, the future is no place to place your better days, which is why it's time for me to take off. Thanks again so much for everybody's support. You are indeed welcome, Mark, and thank you for all you've done for us. And again, we look forward to properly recognizing you and sending you off at the appropriate time. With that being no, there being no further business, we are hereby adjourned, ladies and gentlemen. Please stay safe and healthy. I call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>